Can you hear me now, Jack? Yeah. Good. I thought we'd start off just by giving us some idea of, of the nature of the film that you're doing up there. What's it all about? Uh, it's a film about, um, I guess you'd say, military justice or injustice, really. It's a story of two guys who are taking a young kid to, uh, they're delivering him to Portsmouth Naval Prison. Uh, for what? What, what? what did the kid do? He uh, stole some money, $40, gets eight years. Hmm. Are you, do you... <laughs> That's just what I said. <laughs> <laughs> do you play the role of the, uh, the kid? No. No, I'm one of the guys that's taken him to jail. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, while, since you've been in Canada, have you uh, heard anything about any of the American uh, uh, draft dodgers or some of the young men who went up there to avoid the, or evade the draft? Well, uh, there are a lot of them around, you know. I mean, I you talk to a few of them every once in a while. Tell me, tell me what that's like, because I never have, and I'm sure a lot of people here would be curious what they're like, how many of them are there, or what kind of things they tell you, how they feel about the country, you know, all that. Well, all different kinds. I ran into a guy, for instance, I, was, uh, I went out to pick up a friend at the airport at Toronto, and a guy got off uh, there, and he came walking over to me. I was just sitting on the railing there, and he knew me uh, by sight. So he came walking over and said hello. I asked him what he was doing. He said, well, he, he'd been very involved in the McGovern campaign, and uh, he was uh, 29 years old. Hmm. And he feels as a result of his political involvement, at 29 he was reclassified and made 1A, uh, had to take a physical for the draft, and uh, he uh, decided that he, he just couldn't go and came to Canada, and he was just getting off the plane. He didn't even know how he was going to get into town. Wow. Or uh, what he was going to do. Or gave him a lift to town. He, uh, I talked to him. I said, you know, uh, probably really the... Probably not the right thing, but the easiest thing is just, you know, especially for a guy 29 years old, knows what's happening, going to be able to get easy duty or whatever it is, or mm -hmm. special services or type or, you know, mm -hmm. it's easy to avoid the war and be in the army, you know, but that's, he felt it wasn't the right thing to do. And, uh, and he was really, you know, he had a very special, emotional charge about him you know he didn't was really a guy who I guess you know he used old cliche without a country or something I don't know you and you and I have have never discussed that would you have gone Jack I mean if you had been drafted during the height of the Vietnam War would would you have uh, left the country or gone to jail or gone to the army well I, I don't know well Elliot I really don't know you know I mean it's not fair for me to say now because I'm not in it I you know, I will tell you, uh, you know, it, it, I might very well have gone, even though I, I managed to avoid the draft. I, I'll tell you, I remember mainly worrying about the draft from the time I was about 10 years old, which is, I think back on it now, is a pretty early age to have that kind of thing hmm. creeping in on your psyche, you know. Hmm. But uh, I like to think that I wouldn't have gone, but... Uh, you know, on some kind of moral grounds, because I certainly disagree with the war, but then at the same time, I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't, you know, the grand gesture is not really my style. I would have done whatever I thought was the smartest thing for me at the time, just like everybody else, I guess. It is it is an interesting and, and very evident uh, facet of your personality that you frequently demonstrate your political, emotional, uh, spiritual beliefs and feelings in much more subtle ways than most people do. You never go in for grandstanding. With you, most things are an understatement. Is that by uh, design or accident, Jack? Well, I, I don't... I, probably neither. I mean, I just... It's... it's and you could maybe say it was style, but I don't think that would cover it. I, I, you know, I mean, I just think I figure them out, and that's the way I wind up thinking it's the best thing to do, you know. 
But but you do usually try. Uh, I, I mean, you, your life is based more on subtleties than than most, isn't it? Even your professional life. I mean, you are very you are very unlike the movie star that that people would imagine you would be, aren't you? Uh, well, I don't know what they would imagine me to be. I, I think I am pretty unlike a movie star. You know, all I, almost any moment you catch me, all I'd have to do is describe my environment to prove <laughs> that to you. Jack, describe your environment. Well, I'm uh, I'm in a condominium in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little bit better than Holiday Inn, I suppose. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a uh, sort of a green silk curtain over. I look out and out at the uh, brick wall of a football stadium right across the way. Um, got a book about Napoleon and a traveling alarm clock. <laughs> Just unpacked from location. I was gone for four days. I took two shirts, one pair of jeans, <laughs> my running togs. And uh, and that is not unlike you. I mean, it it, it is it is intriguing with with so many successful films behind you now. Y your lifestyle, your ge your general way of living, even in Los Angeles, uh, is very unlike that that most people who really become terribly successful engage in. Well, I mean, I I I, I didn't finish. I do have three suits in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but even... dreamed about last night, as a matter of fact. I had a tremendous dream last night. Tell us about the dream. Um, I was in a house. Uh, as I, well, After I woke up and figured it out, I'll tell you about that later, but like two or three miles away, my mother was in the dream. She's dead, as you know. Yes. Uh, my niece and nephew were in the dream, and this, like, lightning storm was way... It looked like 20 miles away, and I was watching it out of the bedroom window, and... Pretty soon I saw that there were like flames leaping 20 feet in the air, and it was like maybe four miles away, and I thought, my God, this thing is going to come all the way to where I am and burn this house down. And I got into that thing of figuring, well, if your house was burning down, what were the things that you would save? Mm -hmm. And uh, I got everybody in the family rolling and all this, and I, I knew that I was looking for something specifically. I think I took some paintings first and then maybe books, and I managed to, before the flames got there, get almost everything out, but I couldn't find my suits. Wow. Couldn't <laughs> find my suits, which was really, I think, what I might have been looking for to begin with. But then after I was out of the dream in the morning, I realized this was the house I lived in as a child, and I didn't have those suits. Fascinating. That, that I, I couldn't believe it. I was looking yeah. all over this house for suits, but the character in the dream didn't know I didn't have it. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's really interesting. Yeah. Is, it, is it difficult? I mean, you've been in Toronto now a, a month or so. You're going to be there a total of four months in Canada. Yeah. You, your last film, King of Marvin Gardens, you were almost a half a year in... Uh, in Atlantic City, uh, is are these trips so uh, lonely and difficult for you, Jack? Being away from L.A. and your friends and all of that stuff. Well, uh, um, I feel like I earn my money because of it. You know, I mean, it's not it's not much fun. I'll, you know, I mean, uh, Toronto is a very nice city, actually. But I mean, you most of the time, you know, if if you have the lead in a movie. Uh, you wind up, uh, you work every day. You yeah. Know? I mean, you're in most of the scenes, so you really don't really even get to see a town like you would if you were normally traveling, because uh, when a movie shoots on location, you work six days a week, and you just have Sunday off. And mm. Usually, like, for instance, in Toronto, everything closes pretty much at 10 o'clock on Sunday. By the time you get that one long day of sleep, and you, really, you don't, you know, like I've been to Canada three out of the last four winners on movies, actually. Hmm. And aside from uh, Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and Gordon Lightfoot and the people that I've met from Canada and L.A., I really don't know any Canadians. Hmm. You know, and I probably have spent a total of uh, maybe nine months out of the last, uh, you know, two or three years up here. And, uh, that must really be really a bummer after a while, doing that stuff. Well, I like the work, you know, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you are at work, and I do like to work, but, you know, I mean, I don't, it's not so bad as all that, I mean, but, 
it, it's not uh, it's not real romantic. I'd like to play some jewel thieves on the Riviera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after this, I think, and in the summer when I look good. What's your favorite film so far, Jack? My favorite film in the world? No, that that you've been in. The, your favorite role in your favorite film that you've acted in thus far. Oh, yeah, that's like asking you what your favorite child is. <laughs> it's not really fair. There must be Especially one. Especially not to the moms. There must be one that you feel particularly closest to, I would think. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's some looking back that you can't even relate to anymore. Well, I mean, I, I won't, I won't start being diplomatic with you at this point. Probably, I would like Five Easy Pieces best. I think. Yeah. You know, if, if I had, was forced to give an answer, but I, I, I like pretty much uh, the fi most of the films that I've been doing. I, I like the one that I just finished. I like King of Marvin Gardens very much. I, in fact, it had certain satisfaction for me that uh, wasn't in the uh, weren't in the other films it was uh, you know uh, I don't know how to find a better word but it was more exactly played you know I mean I found less fault with myself in it hmm. uh, the role itself is not too romantic and it's not going to uh, uh, you know create a kind of animalistic excitement in the audience or anything like that but uh, aesthetically I was real happy with it you know I mean I like to look at a movie and be able to look at it and say well I wouldn't have done anything any different you know with the part and uh, uh, you know I, li I like I like them all I uh, some of them are interesting to me for a lot of reasons like carnal knowledge I I keep looking at that and keep thinking uh, well, this film had a much bigger... I talked about the film that people talk to me most about for some reason. Carnal Knowledge they talk to you about most? Yeah. More, uh, more than Easy Rider? Well, Easy Rider gets mentioned because that's a movie that, you know, like yeah. was like a big uh, po popular uh, success for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but as many people have seen Carnal Knowledge, really. It's just Easy Rider got a whole different... Uh, press for it. You yeah. Know? I, I interrupted you. You were going to say something about their reactions to you of uncarnal knowledge. Well, I mean, it did. I, you know, I mean, to me, the movie was not as controversial as, as, as the way in which it registered on the, on, on an audience. Uh, you know, they really project that role onto my life. And, uh, you know, a lot of women relate to me in a certain way because of it. And, uh, that kind of thing, and that makes it very interesting to me. Uh, you know, I like I like it when the thing has a a deep impact. People really related to this character who re couldn't sustain a relationship, and uh, who uh, you know has, has no apparent reason why he didn't sustain a relationship. Who's sort of practicing what are contemporarily fashionable. Mm. sexual standards and sexual behavior and then winds up as this kind of tragic uh, John at the end of it uh, you know it, 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 a lot of <laughs> a lot of people have related to the character and a lot of people think it's my life you know and, and that that bothers me in a certain way I keep wondering well is this film going to wind up being prophetic of my life in some way that I don't know yet you know. It is very interesting that in, in most of your films, and the, and the latest one uh, is going to open in Los Angeles in December, so I haven't had a chance to see it yet. I, I hear in it uh, uh, you, in part, play play the role of a guy who's in radio, who does a talk show. Right. So I can't wait to see a that. A monologist, actually. A monologist, yeah. yeah. Uh, but in, in, so, in so many of the films that you've done that I've seen... Um, the character is a we I mean they are tragic films they're about people who just who are misfits who can't who can't put it together who can't really sustain themselves you know people you know who just dissolve at the end and I've always wondered if people meeting you for the first time uh, identify you with those characters because you are very unlike all the people you portray in your movies 
they do. I mean, I think they do with everyone. You know, I mean, even before this, when I did motorcycle pictures, people people used to think uh, I was a motorcycle person. Mm. Uh, for instance, Leslie Kovacs, who you know has shot, uh, mm -hmm. he shot Easy Rider and mm -hmm. Five Easy Pieces and The King of Marvin Gardens. Mm. Well, Leslie and I had worked on a motorcycle film before those, and... Uh, and in fact, the first one we did together, Leslie quit the job before we finished because it was kind of a very raunchy production, and it was improvised largely. And uh, Leslie thought I was a motorcycle person and <laughs> instructed his wife that she wasn't to eat with me or anything. <laughs> you know. So it, it happens to people even that you're working with. It must truly surprise women in encountering you for the first time, women who would meet you thinking of you as the carnal knowledge guy and finding you to be uh, perhaps uh, almost his uh, paradoxical opposite. Well, I don't know that they do find me the paradoxical opposite. You know, I mean, most of them don't get by the original... Uh, I mean, if they have that... Uh, you know, it's very hard to to uh, to allay a, a uh, an assumption that's been built up mm. by that. You know, I mean, mm. uh, you know, it would take a certain, you know, more than just superficial contact, and you really don't have that with a lot of people. It's true. You know, I don't know if they do get by the original image. I have only one one final question for you, Jack, because I know you got to be up early in the morning. Uh, somebody was interviewing me this afternoon, a kid from a high school paper, and he, he was asking me a, a lot of uh, interesting and, and uh, relatively original questions. And one of the things that he asked me is if I had the opportunity of moving around in the body of somebody currently alive or somebody who ever lived for a day or a week or so, uh, who might I pick just uh, out of curiosity to see the way the rest of the world reacted to me? Do you understand the question? Uh, yes, I do. Who would you have picked, Jack? Well, it's a, it's a slightly more difficult question for me. I mean, I would fly off the top of my head with Napoleon, you know, except that as an actor, uh, you know, uh, having considered playing that role, you, you I have moved around in his body. Hmm. Not for a whole solid day, but for, you know, hours at a time, just thinking about it and projecting and reading about him and so on. So it, it's a game that I've played, you know. And uh, I probably would rather be swept uh, swept up by someone, I think, rather than pick them out and hope that they were very interesting. Because uh, I would tend to, uh, you know, probably c control the image myself. Interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, in other words, I already have some facility moving around <laughs> in other people's bodies, so to speak. I walk at night, you know. <laughs> Jack, the town's nothing without you. Now, Elliot. Pardon me? You got me on this time on the <laughs> telephone. It's an I'm really in limbo, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a new program on ABC Radio, and it's uh, conversations with people like you, and then conversations with people on the telephone. It's wonderful. I don't have no clothes on now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then, this would be an appropriate time for us to say farewell. You, you have been very kind for granting us the time, Jack. It's always a joy doing this with you on the air. It's always a joy knowing you off the air. Well, it's nice to talk to you again, Al. Can't wait for you to come home. Take care of yourself, Jack. Okay. God bless. Have a good evening.